Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today for our Bible study. We are completing our study on God's will and the various aspects of that will that we face about uh, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the church, circumstances. And today we're going to talk about God's will and the glory of God. And uh, we're looking at a very familiar passage and a very familiar story that we read here in this. And we want to see what takes place. The very familiar passage that we're looking at today is John 11, and that, of course, is the story of Lazarus and Jesus and Mary and Martha and all of that that was done, as Jesus said, and as the Scripture said, it was for the glory of God. So it was for God's glory, and that's our focus in life, too, is what we do is to bring glory to the Father, not to us, but to God. God needs and receives all glory from us, which is proper. And of course, next week's Thanksgiving season, so we be, we're thankful. We're giving glory to God for what he has done in our lives. So we look at John chapter 11, and we'll pick up some passages two different places. Uh, Jesus showed that the, de the death of Lazarus always works for the glory, for his glory, for God's glory, not anybody else's. So the message was sent to Jesus one day, he was in and around Jerusalem in that area. And they said, hey, your, friends, your friend Lazarus is very sick, and they would like for you to come. Now, I don't know if that was part of the message, come. But Jesus being a friend of the family and has been a friend and in and out of their homes many, many times, in a little town of Bethany was just a couple of miles out of Jerusalem. That was kind of a hiding place for Jesus to get out of the Jerusalem area where all the religious leaders were and all the hubbub and all the difficulties that they were trying to create for him. So he often went out to Bethany and would spend time with his friends there. So uh, they wanted Jesus to know Lazarus was sick. I don't think they, I don't think, unless I come across it in Scripture again, that they said, come quickly. I don't think that was in the message. But they just wanted him to know uh, about what was going on so he could respond accordingly. And, uh, of course, they didn't even know where he was. First of all, the messenger had to find him. They, they didn't have a telephone, didn't put out a, a message system of some kind to say, hey, we're looking for Jesus, can you come and respond, and so forth. No, they didn't have that. So they had to find him, first of all. So we're going to look at uh, first four verses, chapter 11 of John. If I get to the book of John here, next page here. So it says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So you remember that. They were eating at Simon the Pharisee's house, which was in Bethany too. And the scripture didn't identify who this person was, but evidently it was Mary. She went in, stood in the room where all of them were eating and she uh, cried and her tears fell on his feet and she wiped his, the tears off his feet with her hair and then she poured this oil, ointment on his feet. Uh, and so she was responding to what Jesus had done in her life, that he had given her the opportunity to know what eternal life was all about and trust and faith in him. So the, that passage script doesn't identify who that woman was, but here um, John identifies that person, who she was. Uh, so she was the same one. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So that was the message. Lord, Lazarus is sick. And say, come, come quickly, come if you can, or whatever. Just Lord, Lazarus, our brother is sick. Can you do something about it? When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So, it was for God's glory. So the message was sent, message was received, and Jesus said, Hey, this sickness is not going to end in death. It's not going to be dead. So, we'll see how this proceeds as we go. So I told you about Bethany, where it was, the town of Mary, and, and her sister Martha and brother, and uh, it was close to Jerusalem where Jesus could come and go and do what he wanted to do in his off time and do that. Well, there were three events in Bethany, the town's known for, of course, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
uh, home of Simon the leper, whom I already mentioned, and it was the location of Jesus' final blessing to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. So three key marks about the little town of Bethany uh, that we are familiar with from the scripture. So when John revealed immediately the two women were sisters, uh, Luke, um, John, let's see, let me go back here. Yeah, John mentioned Martha first, and then Mary, and Luke reversed that. He mentions Mary, and then Martha. Don't know what the consequence, I mean, the, the uh, importance of that is, other than maybe the reference to Martha was that she was the senior sister and she was kind of in charge of the household, which probably she was because she was perturbed because Mary wouldn't come and help with the food and prepare all the meals and feed everybody that was there and so forth. So uh, other than Martha was the senior person there in the household. Doesn't say anything about them having a husband or anybody else in the household. We don't know about that. That's not pertinent to the story here as we think about that. So, <clears throat> uh, the reference to, the, to Mary who anointed the feet of Jesus with that oil. So, the tone of the accounts of Jesus visiting um, indicated a warm friendship between Jesus and this family in Bethany. Well, uh, Lord, the one you love is sick. Come and help us out. Uh, and Lord is a term can be used for sir, just a term of respect. Um, not Lord, you are Jesus Christ who came to die for our sins on the cross for the world. Just a, a courtesy that all people use. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So forth and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but, of course, Mary and Martha sensed that he was no ordinary man as many times he'd been in and out of their home and had spent time with them. So, uh, whether they expected him to come or they trusted that he would do what was best, or if he could at all, if he was anywhere close by to come in time. Uh, <clears throat> they just said, Lord, we want you to know Lazarus is sick. See if you can do something about that. Well, Jesus was somewhere east of the Jordan River, and they had to find him. So they, they located him, gave him the message, and Jesus' answer was, this sickness is not unto death. He's not going to die. This is for the glory of God. That's the key verse, uh, key words in that verse. Uh, he's not going to die. It's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So God's glory is a point of the emphasis here. So it was going to be a display of the glory of God in this instance, that the Son of God might be glorified. Uh, this event did furnish the occasion for the greatest evidence of glory of God up until the point until the resurrection of Jesus. So this was a powerful point an emphasis on the power of God to resurrect somebody from the dead until Jesus came and of course he not only died but he was resurrected and we'll see the end of that that um, Lazarus died and that he was not uh, resurrected he was resuscitated <laughs> because he was going to live and then die again another time before he resurrected so Jesus is the only one who's been resurrected from the dead up to this point, uh, as we understand that. So, the glory of God. The difficulties and challenges of life are always hard for all of us to face, but in those challenges and things we face in life, God can be glorified in what happens in our lives and what we do, that God can receive glory as he works in and through us, as, as uh, Paul says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, according to his purpose, according to his will. So God can bring good out of difficult circumstances in our lives for his glory, not for our glory, for his glory as he works through that. Well, then we skip over to verse 38. And go through verse 43 here and kind of see how this all plays out uh, and, and goes here. Well, this is the point where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus once more deeply moved. Uh, let me go back and talk about it a little bit earlier in, in chapter 11. When Jesus gets there and said, Lord, Martha said, Lord, if you'd just been here, he wouldn't die. Why'd you take so long to get here? 
Well, the messenger had to find Jesus on the first day. And then Jesus waited around for day two and three. And then day four, he went. So it was four days. And so when he appears and Martha says, Lord, if you'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. He would still be here. You could have done something to keep him from, from dying. Uh, and then that famous verse that uh, we hear, and I use, very, I use every time I do a funeral service at the cemetery, a burial cemetery for the closing part, where she, uh, she said, uh, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. She said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So that's a, that's a great verse to use. So they had this conversation when they got there. And of course, all the people were there and the mourners were there. And everybody was there except for Jesus until he got there. He said, Lord, if you'd just been here... This might not be the case here. So we speak up with 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Which the only time we know that a stone had been taken away from the grave was Jesus at the resurrection. They rolled away the stone. I don't know if another tomb was ever, stone was rolled away because People said, hey, it won't do any good to roll away stone. They're, they're not there anymore. You know, they're, they're gone. They're not in their physical body anymore. Uh, and so he said, take away the stone. Then Jesus looked up. No, I'm sorry. But Lord said, Martha, sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been there four days. Four days. Uh, they, didn't, um, they didn't do embalming. Back in those, they, the Egyptians, isn't it strange? The Egyptians did embalming way back thousands of years ago, and preserved all those bodies in the big tombs and the pyramids and all that stuff. Yet, the rest of the civilization didn't. Anyway, they didn't do embalming, but they did do the grave wrapping, where they put these cloth strips round and round and round and wrapped up the body um, and, and put spices and perfumes or whatever in there because. Martha's point was, hey, it's going to be a bad odor if you open, take that stone off the, the door, off the stone, the tomb there. It won't be very pleasant, as she said. Uh, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Hmm, yeah. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I, know, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for a benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> let him go again. Let him move forward and get going. Well, we're familiar with verse 35, which I didn't read, and that was, you know the verse, Jesus wept. <laughs> people used to ask people, what's your favorite Bible verse? <laughs> the only one they could think of, Jesus wept. <laughs> so, and uh, you, know why, you know why Jesus called him by name, don't you? Lazarus, because if he just said, come forth, lots of people would have come forth out of the grave, <laughs> out of the tomb. So he had to be specific. Lazarus, I said, you come out. <laughs> Not everybody else that's around here <laughs> to do that. So uh, Jesus was moved with tears with the great grief that she felt. Jesus, uh, was Jesus more uh, uh, moved to tears by Lazarus' death, or was he more moved to tears because of the family? You know, Mary and Martha, and, you know, that's a difficult time. So your compassion goes to the family, those who are still living, rather than the one who has died as a result of that. Uh, so Jesus was moved to tears at this grief that he felt because of Mary and Martha, his great friends. And some of the mourners wanted to know why he didn't, wasn't there to prevent Lazarus from dying. Why weren't you there? Verses 28, 37, as he talked. Well, if you'd have been here, like, they said, like Martha, Mary said, Martha said, if you'd have been here, 
it would have not happened. So, uh, given Jesus' relationship with his family, it would only be natural that sorrow would grieve with them, uh, would share with them. So we know that God identifies with the hurts of us as human beings. If we hurt, you know, he hurts. He feels compassion. He wants to reach out and comfort us. So uh, another word would be deeply moved. Jesus was deeply moved, and as a result, he wept. He cried because of his friend. Uh, one other time that Jesus cried was as he stood on the hill looking out over the city of Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If only it could be like a mother hen and take in my chicks and protect them and care for them because they were so far away from him at that point in time. So the idea was that Jesus said, hey, take away the stone. No, don't. It might not be very pleasant. But um, Martha had forgotten quickly the, the conversation she had had with Jesus when he arrived. Hey, Lord, if you'd just been here, everything would have been all right. Um, didn't I say, Jesus said, if you would believe, you will see the glory of God? Yeah, you will. To have faith with respect to a thing or a person, uh, to place confidence in. So Jesus said, just place your confidence in me. Didn't I just say that it's going to be okay? It's not unto death that this would happen, but it's going to be for the glory of God. So, Jesus expected her to believe to the point of obedience. Yes, Lord, I believe what you said. When he asked her back, back in verse uh, uh, 25, uh, Jesus said, your brother rise again. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and life. You know, even though you, you're living now and you die, you're still going to live if you have faith and, and relationship with me. So they took, out, took away the stone. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and Jesus was lifted up his eyes and prayed. And as he said, uh, he said, Lord, he said it out loud for everybody to hear. Father, thank you that you hear me. And of course, he said that for their benefit, not for his, because he was already in communication with, with God. But he said it for their benefit, because he'd always been with him. They always had a communication. Well, how do, <clears throat> how do we test something that's truly we think is truly from God and, and to be obeyed. How do we test that and ought to be obeyed? One, he will never ask us to do something that goes against his character. God will never ask us to do something that goes against his character. God is truth. God is holy. God will never ask us to do something that goes against who he is and what he has said he is through, we read the Old Testament, see who God is as he revealed himself to the, the people of Israel. And secondly, or to take action that's inconsistent with Scripture. If it's not consistent with God's Word, then He's not going to ask us to do that either. So that's the way we can test that kind of thing. Um, when we reveal, when we're revealed to us that it is from God, and that's how we test it. You know, we're supposed to test things sometimes to know if it's the truth. Not, we know the truth comes from God. But if other people, sometimes it's the uh, disciples and Paul fought the false teachers in the New Testament. They were teaching everything that was completely wrong. And so Paul says, you've got to test their teachings. See where they're doing and how they live in their lives and where they're coming from. Test it. Don't just take in and believe everything everybody tells you. That's supposed to be true. So you've got to test things sometimes. <clears throat> So the prayer was over. So what next? He said, Lazarus, come out of the grave. Come on out. Come forth with a loud voice, he said. Uh, only then could they see the glory of God. Well, if Lazarus had not come forth out of the tomb, there would be no glory there for God to receive. So the only way people would be convinced would see Lazarus come walking out of the tomb. I wonder how he was able to walk wrapped up in all those strips of cloth. Uh, most of us would trip and fall uh, to do that. Well, we see what happens next. And it says, he came forth out of the grave. Uh, dead man came out, wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. We remember when the resurrection and the, the women went to the tomb, they went in there and they found the grave clothes all wrapped up neatly and placed there 
on in the tomb. Um, Lazarus came out with strips of it still hanging around him. Uh, evidently had enough to, off of his legs to be able to walk and to get out of there. So this was uh, the, the, what was done to reveal to them that God receives is honored and of our glory. So everybody come out, not everybody. Uh, he came forth and here he was a person who actually was dead at one time. Now today with a lot of the uh, modern technologies and stuff, we hear about people who supposedly was dead for X number of minutes and then was revived and came back to life. And uh, we've, we've heard, I haven't done a lot of readings on people who've had these out-of-body experiences. I don't know if y'all read those stories or not. Uh, some are true and some are not. Some, some have been uh, proved to be false, not true. Uh, so we have a lot of stories about people who out-of-body experiences, they see this, they saw that, they went here, they went there, and, and things that happened. Uh, so this was not an out-of-body experience. God received the glory. Uh, and Jesus' instruction was, loose him and let him go. Take those things off of him or from around him and let him go. Let him walk and move around freely uh, as he can and as he needs to be. So uh, the scripture says this, this, was not a resuscit this was not a resurrection because Jesus in the, in the scriptures is called the first fruits of the dead. So Jesus is the only one who has come forth from being resurrected. Everybody else is a resuscitation um, and to do that. So it's important to understand that point that we can't call it a resurrection. Dr. Hobbs, y'all remember Dr. that name? He came here one time back in the 80s and did a Bible study. It was really, he was a great man. Good, good theologian, a good preacher, and did a really good job. But he says about that, res resurrection means one is raised from the dead to die no more. So that's not the case. That's not true of Lazarus, the widow's son, or the daughter of Jairus. They were brought back to earthly life to die again physically. So theirs was a resuscitation, not a resurrection. This doesn't mean that they were any less dead. They were. You know, the heart had stopped beating. That was it. So Jesus performed this miracle of calling him forth out of the grave and restored life to him. Well, what were the results of that as we think about that? Um, where's the verse? It says, uh, Many of the Jews which came to Mary and Martha, who had seen they were there, saw what took place. And as a result of that, they believed on Jesus Christ. As a result of seeing this, being witnesses, eyewitnesses to something that happened. So they themselves could say, it actually happened. I saw that happen with my own eyes. I saw Lazarus come walking out of the tomb. He's alive. He's alive again. He is here. So some of those could have been some prominent leaders among the Jews. Jerusalem is only two miles away. So it could have been some prominent leaders who were there among the Jewish people that came and saw what took place as a result of that. Um, those who came to Mary could reflect on the mourners. They were the mourners, the people, who, the friends, and other family members and so forth, and followed her out of the house when she went out to meet Jesus. So they were there to see that encounter with Jesus himself and to see the resurrection, not the recitation, bring him back to life of Lazarus as he came forth out of the grave. So they couldn't deny that he was alive. So because of what they saw in believing on him, uh, meaning Jesus, when God demonstrates his glory, then people are drawn to Christ, which further glorifies God. So the more glory and people see and realize in Jesus and reflect, it's more, more glory to God himself for what he did. Uh, in a reference to the priestly prayer, you remember um, Jesus gave before his death. Uh, he said, uh, Father, glorify thy son that your son also may glorify you. 
I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. In John chapter 17. So Jesus had lived to glorify the Father. He said that, quoted that in, yeah, in John chapter 17. This was his prayer. He said, I have sought to bring glory to you. And I've always thought that's our mission and calling as well, is to bring glory to the Father. Not to us, but to reflect on the Father for who he is and what he's done. So his death, in his death, he desired the same. Jesus even obeyed the Father in life and in death. He was willing to go to the cross to die for us. So God deserves all the glory that we can offer up to him every day. We are to glorify God. He is worthy of the glory that we can offer to him. Well, thank you for being here this morning. Next Sunday, we're going to reflect upon Thanksgiving with a message from, uh, lessons from that, living in gratitude. Are we grateful for what God does and has done in our lives over the ages, all through the years that we've been walking on this earth? So stay tuned next Sunday for our lesson on living in gratitude. Thanks for being here today. Let's close with prayer. Father, for this day, we give thanks. We are extremely grateful to you. We have hearts of gratitude that you are worthy of glory, and that glory is reflected in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through that glory, we have opportunities to serve you and to give that thanks for that which you have done in our lives and through our lives. So, Father, we are grateful each and every day. Guide us safely through this week. In Jesus' name, amen.